thank you so much everyone for joining us. So um, tonight we're launching Linda's fabulous chapbook, Count the Ways. It's a prose poetry chapbook. And um, I think that's really important because there's not enough prose poetry. Um, and soon we will have the fabulous um, Cassandra Atherton, the, the Australian queen of prose poetry, come yes. to talk to us about um, yeah. the importance and, and the beautiful um, things that prose poetry can offer to us. Um, myself, I don't write a lot of prose poetry, but I absolutely love to read it. And I very much admire everybody who does read it. So um, first I'd like to say a couple of thank yous. Um, the first is to my co-host, um, not co-host, sorry, my co-editor, Elise Blaney. So she helped to edit this fabulous um, book. So thank you so much for your contribution, Elise. It was absolutely invaluable. My second thank you is to Susan McCreary, who came in um, at the last minute and gave us some amazing um, last bit of proofreading, which we actually realized we needed. So <laughs> that was really, really helpful. Thank you so much to Susan. Uh, also, I would love to thank um, our amazing blurbers. So um, here's the book, if nobody has seen it. And we've had Cassandra Atherton, who will be speaking in a moment, Julie Chevalier and Ali Whitelock. And they wrote some amazing blurbs they were so generous in giving their time um, for that so thank you so much to them and of course thank you to Linda for being a dream to work with I don't think well, I've ever you. worked with an author who's so easygoing and relaxed <laughs> <laughs> um oh make a suggestion oh that's fine yes let's go with that so it was absolutely the, the easiest easiest book ever to publish so um i'd like to introduce our first um special guest which is cassandra atherton so cassandra is an award-winning prose poet and international expert on prose poetry she was a visiting scholar in english at harvard university a visiting fellow at sophia university japan and is currently professor of writing and literature at at Deakin University. Cassandra co-authored Prose Poetry, an introduction, and co-edited the Anthology of Australian Prose Poetry. Her most recent book of prose poetry is Leftovers. She is a commission, commissioning editor for Westley Magazine and associate editor at Mad Hat Press USA. Welcoming Cassandra. Hi Welcome. Michelle, thank you so much for having me. It's a Real joy to be here. I kind of wish we were all together in a room physically, but virtually is exciting too, because you can have people from kind of all over Australia and potentially internationally too. So um, so I like to think that we've built different kinds of poetry communities on Zoom. Um, I want to say congratulations to Linda on this amazing book. It's beautiful. Um, it's fabulous. Everyone should get multiple copies and give them as Christmas stocking stuffers. We're not that far away. Um, so have a definitely have a think about that. Um, I've always thought that Linda has a real gift for the short form and, and prose poetry is one of those brilliant forms that, as Michelle has said, is really proliferating. Uh, I am devoted to prose poetry, that ubiquitous block of usually fully justified text on the page I find incredibly seductive. And I actually think any poet or fiction writer who hasn't tried it should give it a try because it is kind of wonderfully subversive in its use of sentences and paragraphs. So a lot of my students, or if I'm teaching writers workshops, you know, a, a lot of students will say, oh, I don't know about poetry. I'm, I'm sort of more of a fiction writer, but you give them a prose poem and they kind of maybe think it's short fiction. So before they know it, they're in the poem and they're like, you tricked me, it's a poem, but that's the joy of it because then they don't want to stop reading. And that's one of the fabulous things about, about prose poetry and it's kind of compression. So I just wanted to, make a few kind of mentions about the things I'm asked quite a lot about with prose poetry. And the first one is, can you define the prose poem? Uh, it is tricky. There's no real consensus on what makes a prose poem, but in a scholarly book on the prose poem that we wrote for Princeton, Paul Hetherington, my co-author and I argue that prose poems are usually fragmentary and brief, and many prose poems occupy one page or less because they allow the reader to swiftly gain a kind of visual impression of the whole work, you know, that one massive kind of bite just on that one page. Linda has so many of those kind of gorgeous bites on the page. Um, 
Prose poems are typically fragments resisting closure and reading prose poetry is often a fairly rapid experience because of the brevity of words. Um, but the experience can also be quite drawn out because poetic language has the capacity to slow the reader's apprehension of time and to thicken or congest language's movement. So it's this constant, you know, push and pull. Um, one of the poems, it's a, it's a short one, and I'm going to read it for you, is called Dusk on Boxing Day. It's one of my favourite prose poems in this selection. As prose poetry has been around for a long time in the West since early 19th century France and is finally having a renaissance, poets are familiar enough with the prose poem form to start playing with it. And this poem I like because it plays with prose poetry in the way that it uses forward slashes in between some of the phrasing. And we're generally used to seeing those slashes when we refer to uh, breaks in lineated poems. But the exciting thing here, it's like a prose poem that's ghosted by lineation. Um, so I'm going to read it. It's called Dusk on Boxing Day. Neighbours smoke out the back, set on a terracotta ocean. Camping chairs, sluggish carts drawn by donkeys. One wooden leg broken. TV so large, a western flawed hero, each one. A baddie with a soft spot, loves a woman and lets her go. The goody two-shoes sheriff sacrifices himself. Green lattice at the window. Spotify music channels blare surround sound. Fake rock speakers, train steam and electric gurgle away stuck on track, stopped in front of the water tank, piling up a shopping trolley with tow trucks and orange Volkswagens, brightened coals burn doors down, pansies glower, they want to come inside. It's all about choices. Rainbow balls hold no more than a shaken yellow head. The sun is a pallid fool. He's gone to his sisters, needs capsicum spray to write I love you across the sky. And the ending is really marvelous. And the, the final point I'd like to add is that prose poems and other short forms need to have wonderful endings. And I'm going to leave you with a quote from the UK prose poet Ian Seed, who says, at the end of a prose poem, you feel like a dog barking at the shape of air. And I think that's exactly what that amazing ending does. So congratulations again and congratulations to Michelle for the, the beauty of the chapbooks that have been um, produced. And um, yeah, huge congratulations all around. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Cassandra, for those wonderful words. Um, so I'd like to introduce the launcher of um, our chat book, Hayley Scrovener. So um, before I do, actually, uh, I'd like to let you know that um, we're having a book giveaway tonight. So um, Hayley's going to launch the book and she's going to have a little chat to um, Linda as well. And she's going to ask her some questions. And within those questions will be the answer, the hidden answer to the um, um, question that will get you a free copy of Count Your Way. So we'll be giving out um, two, two books tonight. So the first two people to answer um, the question, which will come later. So listen carefully. Um, if you don't happen to be one of those people and you'd like to buy the book, which we really hope you will do to support Linda, um, you can go to the Verity La um, bookshop online and use the code COUNT25 to get a 25% discount. Okay, so that's that over. I will introduce Hayley. Hayley is a writer and former director of Wollongong Writers Festival. She lives and writes on Darawal country and has a PhD in creative writing from the University of Wollongong. Hayley's fiction and non-fiction have appeared in a range of Australian literary journals and she was shortlisted for the Overland uh, Story Wine Prize. She was awarded the 2019 Ray Cope ASA Fellowship for her novel about a young girl who goes missing from a small country town. In 2020, this manuscript was shortlisted for the Penguin Literary Prize and won the Kill Your Darlings Unpublished Manuscript Award. So I'd love to introduce Hayley. And as you listen, don't forget to listen out for the... Um, for a lot of details, which will give you the answer to Linda's um, book giveaway question. And also, if you have any questions for Linda um, as, she, as she talks and discusses her poetry, please type them in the Zoom um, chat and we'll, we'll take questions at the end. Okay, over to Hayley. Thanks so much, Rochelle. Um, and a big thank you to Verity La for having me, allowing me to launch um, Linda's fantastic collection. 
So um, full disclosure, Linda and I share a back fence. So we're, we're longtime friends, more recently neighbors, but very, um, I feel very lucky to be so close to Linda. And so I should start by saying um, tonight, Linda and I are both on the lands of the Wadi Wadi people of the Darawal Nation. We'd like to pay our respects to elders past and present um, and acknowledge that the land we're on was never ceded. Um, and we're very grateful for ongoing custodianship of this beautiful place where we live. Um, and love and write poetry. Um, Linda a lot more prolifically and better than I do. Um, and I should, so that kind of gives you a sense of me as a bit of an interloper at this event. I'm not a poet of Linda's calibre, um, but she always answers my stupid questions with good grace. So I hope she will continue to do that um, tonight. And so I should read Linda's bio um, because it is pr uh, prolific and impressive as she is. Linda Godfrey is a writer, poet and editor and has a Masters of Professional Writing from the University of Technology, Sydney. She's published poetry and short stories in anthologies and online. Linda was the program manager of the Wollongong Writers' Festival from 2015 to 2018. She curated Rocket Readings, readings of poetry, um, which formed part of Sydney Writers' Festival and Viva Le Gong from 2007 to 2018. She's a fiction reader for Overland and was the online fiction editor for Overland Autumn 2018. She's, um, and she reviews the Newtown Review of Books. She has been a recipient of, the Varun, of a Varuna Residency and an Australian Society of Authors Mentorship. She's edited three award-winning books, including one Miles Franklin winner. She's taught writing both short stories and poetry in the community to adults and children for many years. Linda loves the prose poem. And I'm so grateful. Um, <laughs> I want to thank Cassandra for defining that so that I don't have to. I'm very, very grateful for that. Um, and so beautifully as well. Um, and Linda is also an ancient history tragic, uh, which hopefully we'll get mm -hmm. into a little bit tonight. Yeah. Um, and Linda will fulfill her ambition to live on the beach at Agia Triada in Crete, where the Minoans built a summer palace. That's her, her goal, her determined goal. <laughs> um, so again, thank you to, to Michelle and Elise, who were the editors of this. Um, and there is a great, uh, Michelle mentioned some of the great sort of puffs uh, just astonishing quotes that Linda got for this collection, but I want to read this one from Ali Whitelock in particular because I think it sets us up for our conversation. So Billy Collins says at the end of a poem he wants the reader to be slightly disoriented, like he drove them outside of town at night and dropped them off in a, in a cornfield. Having just read Count the Ways, I find myself knee deep in that cornfield. I will find my way back to town, but please leave me here with these words a while longer. This is cool, daring, edgy poetry. Um, and so here we are in a cornfield all together, socially distanced, because it's a large um, cornfield, which is lucky. So I want to start um, with yet another quote. Sorry, I, I think writers, we all love our quotes. So Montlu Konik Blasing is a poet who's a native of Istanbul. Um, and one of the best parts of knowing Linda has been traveling with Linda. And we've both been to Istanbul together. And I know that's a city she loves, which is why I chose this poet. Um, she wrote, poetry is a cultural institution dedicated to remembering and displaying the emotionally and historically charged materiality of language. So I'll say that again, emotionally and historically charged materiality of language. And so what I love about this collection is almost on one hand, you've got this real life made even more real. You know, there's these wonderful sort of slice of life moments that feel all the more vivid for what is kind of left out and, and the language that is chosen. And then on the other hand, you've got these beautiful poems that are almost an, more so an event of language where I'm not always sure where I am. You know, I'm sort of dazed in the cornfield, but I, I know that I'm, I'm having a good time. Um, so I'm thinking here of like little noises of the house and the Saturday rag, these really kind of, um, yeah, events of language that I love. So Linda, I wondered if you could yes. just kind of, <laughs> sorry, I know I just talked a lot, but if you- no, that's good, that's good. <laughs> um, kind of situate this collection for us. Let us know a bit about how you came to write it and how you would describe it, um, because I'm I'm much more interested in your your take on it than my take on it. You know? Yeah. <laughs> First of all, I want to say thank you for everyone turning up. All the faces. It's absolutely beautiful. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, so I've had a writer. It was Jan McKemish describe my style of writing as domestic gothic. And so I do often take a domestic scene and meld it with whatever social or political issue at the time is irritating me. <laughs> so that's sort of part of the collection. And another side to my writing is um, to take a scenario and flash onto images that gradually build up into a much bigger picture uh, for the reader to experience. For example, I'll take Little Noises of the House and I wrote this with 
Julie Chevalier. Oh, there she is. <laughs> we were staying um, we were staying at a house under the escarpment in Wambara, and like you know, out in the bush, of course. And so it was dead silent. And so I just started writing, only using one sense, like hearing. And so gradually, um, all these sounds emerged from the silence. So I wrote them down to capture, capture the unique um, sound of that particular space. And so that is a poem of gradually images just build up and up and up and up to get the um, sense of the entire place. Um, so this is my first collection of poetry and it's an accumulation of writing over a very long time. <laughs> so naturally I have interests and themes running through um, the poetry. I have had individual poems published, which is, like I said, my first collection. So I would like to say that I had a theme and wrote to that, but I have to say I got out my poetry folder and I looked at all my poems and jammed all the best ones into a file and sent them out <laughs> asking to be published. And I must say that Elise and Michelle picked out the absolute gems from the collection and now we have the chapbook, Count Your Ways. So how many poems were in that original manuscript? I think there are about 31. Wow, so we're really looking at the at the cream of the crop here. Yeah, creme de la creme, um, absolutely. <laughs> and, I, and they've got a very good eye, those editors, <laughs> very good eye. And it does feel cohesive, even if, even if you know, there's that, those two sides, I feel like I identified those real life and then sort of elevated moments of language and of course healthy um, dashes of travel and yes. and sort of Greek mythology and we'll get into that. Yeah. Um, I I loved uh, Dusk on Boxing Day that Cassandra read. Is that based on the the Boxing Day cricket match that happens near, near our place? No, it's no. just kind of a collection of... Look, this is probably revealing too much. Before you lived there, it was actually based on the house that you live in because they had a green lattice um, curtain but they also had this massive TV screen from our house. You could practically see what was on TV in their house. So it's there. Oh, I love know. that. So that poem is set <laughs> at, at my place. 14 <laughs> Porter Street, yeah. Um, oh, wonderful. So the, Cassandra talked about sort of prose poetry and I, I guess I just wanted to know, even I, a sort of a, a, a novice, sort of got that this beautiful kind of breathless quality to it, and the and, this, and the way we kind of move through the poems, and I think Cassandra set us up so well for a discussion of that. And I'd sort of would love to hear what's in it for you, why you in particular enjoy it, or what what draws you to it as a poet. The prose prose poetry form, I mean. Um. Well, the prose form, yeah. Um, well, it can be described as like poetry can be described as like making emotion concrete. You evoke feelings by describing scenes. And, you know, I'm a, I'm a lateral thinker. You know, I couldn't analyse my way out of a paper bag, really. So I have, you know, two or three disparate ideas going on in my head at the same time. And I need to mash them together to make a point. So I like to build up images and ideas and snapshots and connections between those ideas. And I think the prose poetry form really lends itself to this piling of images, one on top of another, particularly becomes whole of it, understanding, not just for me, but hopefully for the reader as well. It's not necessarily the slow and considered poem that is the line poem. It's more, you just push it all together and then it just goes. <laughs> That's why I like the prose poem. And I do get that sense of this wonderful, um, I love Lulu, the poem where you're, you're driving to pick up your granddaughter. <laughs> yes. And um, I'm sure everyone or anyone, who, almost anyone who knows Linda would know that a lot of us call her Lulu and particularly her granddaughter calls her Lulu. Um, but I do have to say that I am in protest here wearing my Billy Joel oh, t-shirt because he's no. much blind in that particular <laughs> poem. And I just want to make that quiet form of protest you know, my, my attendance at the, this event is not an implicit um, approval of that, of that particular sentiment. Sorry, I had to, I had to slip that in there. Um, but I sort of talking about, um, and Cassandra brought this up as well, this idea of the slashes in some of the poems. And yes. so I'm, um, I'm wondering, you know, and I, I do that sense of, of pause, but I wondered why you use slashes or how you kind of conceive of those, those in the poems that they're, that they're in. Okay, well, I mean, they, the slashes do indicate pauses, you know, like in a line poem, 
you would move the line you know, down to the next line to indicate that pause, but I use the slashes. Um, but for me, most importantly, it gives the reader time to absorb the image that they're reading about immediately. And then they go onto the next image but they need to be able to, you know, like assimilate them, I suppose. So I use that, um, you know, to appreciate the connection between my style and, you know, because I've already mentioned that I jam ideas and images together. Um, so that's why I use them to slow the reading down. But it's also very handy for me when I'm reading out loud in public, because I don't actually read out loud much to myself. <laughs> but Just a reminder to breathe. To remind me to breathe yeah. <laughs> and also to slow down because there are poems you know say train to homework that people find quite amusing but i'm so busy trying to read it that i forget that people want to like pause and laugh and so that's mm -hmm. what the slashes are for well i'm so glad you brought up train to home bake yeah um because to be totally honest my favorite poem of the whole collection is is probably lily and, and that's a poem that I know is based on, um, well, the, the title is the name of one of your daughters and yeah. anyone who's read the poem would immediately get this great sense of um, this distillation of kind of teenage female experience in this one wonderful poem. Mm -hmm. um, but I, so I know where that, I know where Lily comes from. I feel like I know it, but I, I'm dying to know where Train to Home Bake comes <laughs> from because anyone who hasn't read it, who hasn't got a copy yet, um, you need to rectify that as soon as possible. And I think Verity La have a discount code happening tonight that we might talk about later. But um, that poem is just so amazing. And I want to know, please tell me how, how it came to life. I'm dying to know. Okay. So both Lily and Train to Home Bake are what's known as found poems. So Lily is accumulation of all the things my children as teenagers said to me and expected me to believe. Like, you know, that's not, that's not dope, that's incense. You know, that smells incense. And the other one was, um, I can't work Saturdays because I have to, you know, what if there's a party Friday night? So things like that, you know, all those things that kids say. And I called it Lily because she was, um, she started off the entire poem because she opened up the fridge and went, there's nothing to eat in this house. I just, I wrote down that poem like in about 10 minutes. <laughs> so it's that one is that. There's, there's always something to eat in your house. Like absolutely. Never, absolutely. It's not a problem your family experiences. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so train to home bake it was an absolute gift. I was on the train going to Sydney and I was sitting behind six young people who are obviously on their way to the home bake um, music festival. And they were just talking amongst themselves, just chatting. And I was absolutely fascinated by what they were saying, but it was also hilariously funny. So I just sat there quietly writing in my no notebook all the way to Sydney. And then um, I just, well, it took me a while to fashion it into a poem, but I did that. So it's 99% from those kids. Oh, that's what I was really hoping for, that they it was found <laughs> in the wild. Um, yeah, it is. Oh, fantastic. I, I feel justified in terms of there is just something so you couldn't make that stuff up you couldn't make those lines up they're just so perfect um i mean maybe you could because you're a fantastic poet but um so uh, and a reminder that we will be having questions we'll be getting questions from both um the facebook live and zoom is my understanding and so you can I put that question in the chat now if you want to. There's nothing stopping you if you want to start um, formulating that question in your mind. You're very welcome to do that. Um, and we'll be, we'll be taking uh, questions, as I said, from both Zoom and Facebook Live. Um, so, Linda, you have this kind of history as, as such an active sort of literary citizen in our, our community and in Sydney in terms of you've been a curator for things like Rocket Readings. You and I worked together for, for years at, at Wollongong Writers Festival and Wollongong is so lucky to have had you as a program director. I feel like everything, every event I've been to that that you have curated um, has, has been an enriching one. And I just think you are, um, you're, you're so in, in the mix and so willing to kind of, um, and interested in other writers and supporting other writers. Um, so I wanted, I guess I, I'm curious in the context of someone who is both an event maker, um, an editor and all those things, and someone who's just had a poetry collection come out, if you had an advice for poets in the audience or for writers <laughs> in general, just life advice, you're very, um, I always say to people that Linda really knows how to live uh, in terms of there's just something effortless about coming to your house and having a glass of wine and talking about writing. And so I just want to know, how do we, how do we be like you, Linda? How do we oh. arrive? <laughs> 
drink more wine maybe. <laughs> Um, look, I think I'm speaking to uh, a captive audience here because all these people, like, the faces I can see, they're all poets. So I don't know whether I should be talking about how to get, you know, out there in the poetry. But, you know, generally, if I'm running a class or I'm talking to people, I always say you've got to get out there and be in the mix. And I, it's true, I don't really get to Sydney that much. But, you know, in Wollongong, I'm around. Um, so turn up at readings, turn up at Zooms, go to workshops meet people, go to open uh, mics and read your work. I think that's a really important thing. And I was um, thinking about it today and I was thinking one of the things that I did and Ali Smith is here somewhere. Um, there you are. She, um, when she was director of the South Coast Writers' Centre, got a small uh, grant from the local uh, council. And I put on the rocket readings, the monthly readings for years and years and got us into the um, Sydney Writers Festival a couple of times. Um, but I met a whole lot of poets. Like I could invite a featured poet every month and pay them and also invite a local poet to introduce them to the local community. And then also people came along and did, um, uh, you know, readings at the open mic. So that was a fabulous way for creating a poetic community of your own. Uh, so that's, yeah, that's a really useful thing to do as well. Um, what was the second part of the question? <laughs> I know, that I said a lot of things, didn't I? It's sort of a, a problem of mine. Um, I think, no, I think that covers it. It was just sort of okay. advice to, to poets and to writers in general about how we might, um, it's interesting, you know, we were just talking about how how much easier in a way with Zoom it is to kind of go to things and I've gone through periods of being a bit um, un, unexcited by Zoom and I feel like I'm just coming back into wanting to come to events and mm. um, yeah, so I think that's solid advice, you know, to, to yeah. just get out there and, and go to things and I think you live live that advice, so. Um, <laughs> Thank you. I, I did want to um this will be my last question because i think i'd love to hear what what um the people out there want to ask you mm -hmm. um so i love the poem ithaca and we've hinted at this um love of greek mythology that you have yeah and and it's a retelling a retelling of penelope's wait for odysseus can mm -hmm. you just tell talk, tell us a bit about that poem and about your interest in kind of greek mythology and how it's in the collection more more generally okay well i'll start with the how I got interested in Greek mythology and ancient history and then I can work into the poem kind of thing. So as a child I had a copy of Nathaniel Hawthorne's Tanglewood Tales and I really loved it. It's considered quite misogynist now but at the time you know Europa the Bull was I just loved it. So anyway the white bull. Um, so then in year 11 at school I took up studying ancient history and we began with the Minoan society you know from Crete and I thought I know this you know so I knew it from the tales and it all just rang true for me and so since then I've just loved ancient Greek and Roman culture and when I travel I specifically uh, for the archaeology and the food <laughs> and the wine in Greece and Roman uh, Greece and Turkey and Asia now I've included Asia as well um, I love temples and I love the ocean so so I love the Iliad and I love the Odyssey and the various translations and I particularly love e Emily Wilson's translation of the Odyssey. And I have a special affinity for the goddesses Athena, Aphrodite, Artemis. I really love all those Greek goddesses. So the poem Ithaca began as a vague idea of two people collecting uh, fruit for to make jam. Um, they turned into pomegranates, but I don't think that'd make a very nice jam. But anyway, it started off as not enough collection. sugar. It'd be okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah maybe. <laughs> uh, and then one of the characters disappears and didn't come back. So that made me think about Odysseus returning to Ithaca because um, in the Odyssey, uh, Penelope and Tele uh, Telemachus understand that a lot of the warriors came back from Troy and they had been back for years and Odysseus still hadn't come back. So I thought it'd be quite good to make him just disappear when they're going through something as domestic as making jam. Um, so the poem's written from the point of view of Penelope and her emotional journey through, um, you know, through waiting for his return. And um, the pomegranate is a recurring theme for me. Um, 
I like them. I grow them. It's the, it's the beautiful <laughs> yeah, colour. On the cover of my magazine, I'm wearing um, pomegranate earrings on a loan from, um, from... From yours truly. Yes, from Hayley. <laughs> uh, but also, uh, I was very connected to the myth of Demeter and Persephone. Um, Demeter was the goddess of the, of the harvest and um, the earth. And she had a daughter, Persephone, who was uh, kidnapped by Hades and taken to the underworld for six months. So she went into grief. And so she stopped, um, stopped like the warmth and um, the harvest. Uh, and so people like basically going into autumn and winter. So when she was trying to negotiate getting Persephone back, um, the deal was because Persephone had only eaten six pomegranate seeds when she was underground, that she would come up back up to the um, world and be with her mother for six months of the year. And then for the other six, she would live with Hades. So, you know, when she's underground, we have autumn and winter, and then we have spring and summer when she comes back to the top. So, and it gives us done... the most restrictive diet plan known yes. to uh, absolutely <laughs> known to man kind of thing. It's a, bit, like, I have a really even... rough Weight Watchers meeting. He's like, oh, I ate six pomegranate seeds, and now I have to, yeah, <laughs> I have to pay. Um, I have and... even um, like subjected various members of various uh, poetry groups to sharing pomegranates with me so to know, know that we'd always be together <laughs> which is lovely and I think is that is that a tradition or like is that from a particular tradition or is that just a Linda no, that's me yeah I just if decided we eat in... pomegranates together we'll stay yeah stay friends we'll stay friends yeah um well I just again want to sort of thank you for um asking me to kind of to, to be here and to to share in in talking about this this collection because I did just enjoy it so much and I, I asked you to prepare a poem to read um is that you're going to did I'll did I? a very short one <laughs> what are you going to read to us I think I might read the naughty little tinder oh that's a fun one yes so you're going to read and then after you do that I'm going to declare it officially launch and we'll open uh, Michelle's going to field some questions from from our audience so let's um it's eight o'clock already so let's hear you read okay it's called love me tinder we've even forgotten the name of my own poems now love me tinder the first week they jumped on the bed and watched tv with their heads together the second week they showed their bottoms to each other then took off all their clothes and lay on the bed watching YouTubes about how to make cartoon cakes. The third week, they stripped down to their underwear, curled up on a sheepskin rug, pretended they were cats, ate biscuits and drank water from the same bowl, went outside on the balcony and skipped rope. When it was time for him to leave, they put on their clothes, picked up their keys and crawled down the stairs of the apartment block, mewing like kittens. I think that one deserves a, a round of applause. Well Got done. a Greek myth to be found in there. Mm, in no, one. maybe it wasn't the best um, segue on my part, but you know, <laughs> it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. I chose the um, poem. <laughs> well, with that, I would like to declare this book officially, this coll beautiful collection officially launched. I think we should do another huge round of applause to Linda Godfrey. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. And again, I'd like to thank uh, Michelle at Verity La and Elise Blaney, who, who edited as well, and Cassandra on sort of Linda's behalf. Um, mm. And I think we're going to go to questions. Is that right, Michelle? I can already see someone's question is, my question is, can you read uh -oh. a poem, please? Ah, you know, yeah. Prepare mm -hmm. yourself, Linda, to pluck another Another, another poem. poem. Oh, okay. Which one should I read? Or, oh, my grandmother's rifle. Can you, can you please? Yeah, sure. Have to find it first. What page is it? I know, oh, I've got it now. Okay. All right. So this poem came from, I was reading, I don't know, it was some kind of, maybe it was a New York time, um, New Yorker or something, where some guy said, um, he was complaining about modern poetry being all about small incidents. And I thought, ooh, remember when men used to say, oh, women only write domestic things? I thought that's just another, another stab at women poets and writers. So I wrote My Grandmother's Rifle. I think it was a bit, the Me Too movement was like in full stream here too. 
my grandmother's rifle. Reading at the breakfast table, I turn to the book pages and there's a complaint from a reviewer. Modern poetry is all about the small incidents from a day. Where's all the important poetry these days? We know about the Greek urn, the tiger, Achilles and Agamemnon, and some guy writing blind. These are the big famous poems, but what about small incidents? Beach comb to see, grass, see glass sorry, from the Dunbar off Watson's Bay, or from Caesarea, where Herod threw an empty bottle into the Mediterranean. A purple mohair rug, now the shroud of a cat. One chook feather glows black and brown when held up to the light. From even before the time of Briseis, real women's lives were made smaller by rapes, beatings, abuse, being sold and traded, used as breeding cattle. The public arena made too vicious for them. Are these small incidents or something secondary for women? Be wary of my grandmother's rifle under my bed, a piece of black stocking tied around the handle and the way I sleep, twisted, legs and hips flat, shoulder and arm over the side, ear half cocked for any noise. Mm. <laughs> Thank you. It really makes me think of what Cassandra said um, and also Ali Whitelock about the feeling at the end of the poem, you know, it's like, oh my goodness, <laughs> meant to go about my day after that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you uh, so much um, to, to Linda and to Hayley. I, I love that poem. I'm so glad that you read it. It's my favourite, actually. Very feisty and feminist. So yes. incredible. Um, so I just wanted to um, butt in, but rudely in, and um, just give our questions for our book giveaway. So I hope everyone was listening um, carefully to the conversation. So the question um, is, uh, what is the connection between the poems Lily and Train to Home Make? So I'll just say it one more time. What is the connection between the two poems, Lily and Train to Home Bake? So the first two people um, to get that one right, get a, a free copy of the book sent. Oh, someone's in oh, there. Oh, Nancy Kilby's already, already there. Woohoo! <laughs> <laughs> and I think if we get someone from Facebook, but I'm not sure how many people will have to have a look on there. But even anyway, the first two, either and either platform, beautiful, will contact you afterwards and send out a, a free book. Ah, Shady Cosmos. Group. there you go done oh julie julie too <laughs> wonderful thank you so um does anybody have any questions for the wonderful linda i'm gonna put it uh our facebook live now onto gallery view so everyone can see everyone you can either type your questions into the chat or you could unmute yourself and wave and we can we can um hear you Oh, there's Shady Good. Let's see what's in the chat, shall we? Oh. Yes, let's have a look. Ah, uh, one, well, one question we have in the chat is could somebody, could could Linda please read another poem? <laughs> Maybe while other people are thinking of a uh, question, we can get you to read one more, Linda. All right. And someone did put in for Lily, I saw. Oh, ah, really? Okay, let's um, do Lily. Lily. McCreary, Beautiful. I think, voted for Lily. Okay. Uh, page two. All right. Well, you know the first line. <laughs> Lily says, there's no food in the house. <laughs> <laughs> there's no food in the house. I'm not eating meat, dairy, lentils, beans, greens. I'm vegan. I want to eat lolly bananas and raspberry creams. Mum. Drive me to Thoreau, to Oste Station. I'm late for school. I'm going to Brooks. I'm bored. I'll eat later. I'm starving. I need money. $30 will do. I saw these boots. I need $280. I'm going to get my lip, tongue, nipple clip pierced. It doesn't hurt. I know a guy who'll do it cheap. He's clean. It's not going to cost $80. It's $20. I've already got the jewellery. I'm going to get a job, leave school, move to Melbourne hair extensions and baby blue streaks. You never let me do anything. Your friends are Como, Linko, Pinko, Lezo, Fat. You're lazy. You don't have a job. No one studies. Oh, 
you, you, no one studies, they say they do. They watch TV. I'm going to town, then to Alana's, be home tonight. I'll be safe. Nothing can happen to me. No one's around to grab me at four o'clock in the morning. Come on over. It's a, not a party, it's a gathering. I don't drink. Buy me a bottle of vodka. I didn't do that. I don't know how it happened. My friends don't do that. I'm not cleaning it up. You're a clean queen, housework lady. Don't you ever go out? Don't you ever sleep in? Leave me alone. I'll do whatever I want. I'm out of here. You're stupid. I'm not talking to him. Tell him I'm not here. Got 40 cents for the phone. This is a while ago. <laughs> Money for a paddle pop. What do you need a train ticket for? They can't prosecute me. I'm under 16. Those Nikes are on special. I need another pair of Patrick's, the baby blue ones. I can't work Saturdays. What if there's a party Friday night? I don't dope, smoke dope. That smell is incense. Don't be rude to my friends. They're not no hopers. They're really nice. Why can't he sleep in my room? Can he stay for a few weeks? He has nowhere to go. He doesn't work. How can he save up for a bond? He doesn't eat much. Can I eat some cake? I need pens, pencils, books my tongue pierced, please. Look at Salty. If you put a, push a whisker up her nose, she sneezes. She slept with me last night, all curled up, curled up. Can we get a dog? Walker's got a staffy pup with tiger stripes. Mom, what's the time? I don't want to go. I would have worn different clothes if I knew we were going out. Put that in a palm and I'll sue you. Oh, Linda, I was just absolutely giggling all the way through that because I've got three tenants. Yeah, I was going to say, you know, <laughs> you know all the phrases. <laughs> I could see a lot of other people in the <laughs> speaker gallery giggling as well. My like, mother is nodding emphatically. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got a few questions now coming in um, in the oh. chat, which is fabulous. So yeah. um one of them is, do you feel the classical references give us a fresh perspective on the contemporary world? That's from Shady Cosgrove. Oh, yes. Well, as a, um, a student of history, I find that, you know, <sighs> history goes in cycles, you know. Like I was thinking about, say, America as um, in the last stages of the Roman Empire probably 20 years ago, you know, I just think, think going round and round in circles. So yeah, new perspectives all the time and things that, um, you know, Zeus were doing and, you know, all those gods were up to, it's coming around again. <laughs> Love it. Thank you. Um, Tim has asked, are there intersections, Greece and Wollongong? Oh, um, no, just my yearning to be out of Wollongong and in Greece. <laughs> How does that sound? <laughs> yeah, that sounds completely uh, understandable. <laughs> um, probably, well, I was actually living in Nara at the time, but there used to be the most gorgeous Turkish restaurant in uh, Wollongong, but he closed down years ago. But yeah, so mm. I'd have to meet the Greek population, I suppose, and drink some ouzo with them. Oh, absolutely yeah, yeah. Just a meeting for sure yeah how about uh, Richard James Allen has said how do your family and friends feel about appearing in your poem like <laughs> often I don't tell them <laughs> so Eva and Lily my two children didn't read the poem Lily until probably a couple of years ago and they were fine they're cool and yeah my granddaughter Noah recognized um my name you know which is Lulu to her in the book and said oh you know oh but she didn't realize that I was driving to um driving to school to pick her up driving too fast <laughs> I think um I think it's very wise the less said the better you know tell it slant as Emily yeah said. absolutely like, write poetry so we don't all get found out <laughs> <laughs> and you know poets um, are observers you know <laughs> they observe yeah. everything nothing sacred and everything's sacred at the same time. That's Absolutely. the cool thing about poetry, I think. You know. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Nancy says, are your kids mortified? <laughs> no. <laughs> they were cool. <laughs> you don't um, move in the same beautiful. circles, they're fine. <laughs> oh, very good. I think that might be all our questions. Unless anyone has anything else, just wave your hand at me if you're on Zoom and we'll, we'll see if I can unmute you. I'm not terribly technological, but... 
I think we're all good. Thank you, everybody. So I thought that we might just end with a very rowdy congratulations. And if you have a glass of tea, wine, or whatever oh, you've got, um, unmute yourself and let's just raise a raise a glass to Linda. So to Linda. feel free to unmute and just make it Woo! very good. <laughs> I would like to say thank you to everyone. Thank you for coming. It's been fabulous. I mean, it's so lovely to see everyone's faces. It's just wonderful.